Morning Minuet, how are you? Good to see you, brother. Top of the morning. And where's Melissa? Is she restroom? No, she's, she is not feeling well today. Oh, so this is it. This is it. Please, Trifecta. Please stay up there. She's not feeling well. Mark's flooded. Yeah, in his basement. Yes, they are. Well, uh, how about I pray real quick and then we can start it. That would be great. All right. Father, we need to come to you. Play musical instruments. We want to give it all to you. We give you all the glory and honor. Fill us with your spirit as we worship you together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, God. Thank you. Discussing God for the Son. 
And I have a sign up for food and beverage if people would like to kind of donate some stuff for the golf tournament, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and have Terry and Trent caught anything in the last yes. year. They caught some fish. 400 pounds. Well, only 400 pounds. Well, the waters are depleted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the report to the EPA. But anyhow, moving right along. Um, Facilities and Ground Survey, don't hesitate to do that. And that is online, and we have a paper copy available in the back. And uh, Charity Play from Melissa Virgin. She's not here this morning, she's not feeling well. You can read about that in the bulletin. Uh, and 9 11 Day, we're going to, uh, Mission and Outreach under Ashley Kaiser uh, has decided that we will participate in bringing canned and non perishable foods to donate to a local food bank. She's going to have some kind of bin in the back. Uh, for us to put our food in there. Bring that next week if you would. It's the following weekend. It's the 9 11 Remembrance. And Golf for the Sun, the deadline is um, uh, next, is it next week? Russ, is that what it is? To get your money in? Is it next Sunday? I believe it's the 12th. The 12th, that's right. The, next, the Sunday after that. All right, so uh, entry deadline is the 11th, and flyers are in the North Face. Any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Great to have everybody here to worship our Lord. Let's all stand as we begin our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Control. If you 
calls the wind and waves to storm. He holds you now and always will. The battle is the roads. Take courage in the fight. The weapons of the soul. Our praise is lifted high. My confidence is shown. My God is gone. In His presence there is perfect peace In His power there is victory
so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make people holy through his own blood. Let us, then, go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that openly profess his names. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For though with such sacrifices God is pleased, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Here is the lesson for today. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. In Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Our gospel reading this morning is from Luke's gospel. The chapter verses 1 through 14 hear the word of the Lord one Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in the house of the prominent Pharisee he was being carefully watched there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not but they remained silent so taking hold of the man he healed him and sent him on his way then he asked them one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may be invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. never seen the general. I've always thought that Grant was a much overrated man, he said. That's my view also, Grant replied. <laughs> Grant sounds like a humble man, doesn't he? Ulysses asked him. By the way, Mark's not here because he's standing in a foot of water in his basement. So if you think Mark, pray for him. Uh, I knew he was all wet, but this is ridiculous. But anyhow. <laughs> So Grant does sound like a humble man, does he not? 
humility, virtue we all want, isn't it? But so hard to get. It's the only virtue that if you think you have, you don't. Right? If I think I'm humble, I'm not humble. It's like the preacher who said he had a great sermon on humility. He was just waiting for a lot of people to show up so he could preach it. You know, get the glory. One place we don't uh, see a lot of humility is in a sport that is about to begin in a couple of weeks. Are you ready for some football? I'm not quite there yet. I know Don McFarland is. He tells me about the Steelers exhibition games. How many passes the quarterback can through the guys over the top. But uh, I remember Tommy Flynn's dad taking me to Hershey, Pennsylvania with Tommy, a friend, to go to the Philadelphia Eagles <coughs> training camp. What I really remember, though, is the smell of chocolate in the town of Hershey, Pennsylvania. <laughs> That was awesome. Football season starts on Thursday, September 8th. The Rams are playing the Bills in a rematch of the Super Bowl. And uh, what does this mean for you and me? It means for the next five months, we get to watch excessive celebrating in the end zone. One day earlier, September 7th, we celebrate the 59th anniversary of the National Football League Hall of Fame. Doesn't that excite you? But there were 17 charter members of that, from Sammy Ball to Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe was a Native American, to the best of my knowledge, out of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He became the most famous athlete of his time. He led the Canton Bulldogs to three unofficial world titles in football. He became the first president of the National Football League. But his athletic prowess wasn't contained to just football. He played six seasons of Major League Baseball and won two gold medals in the 1912 Olympics. King Gustav V of Sweden honored him during the closing ceremonies and told him, you, sir, are the greatest athlete in the world. And Thorpe replied, thanks, King. <laughs> A humble, simple response, thanks, King. He didn't spike his gold medals or do snow angels in the end zone or orchestrate a choreographed routine by all the American athletes there. No, his response was respectful and humble. Today, when a D-back gets an interception, oh my goodness, you think he cured cancer, right? <laughs> Always bothers me. You just intercepted a pass. That's all you did. I mean, your team might be winning because of it, but I'm really not, you know, as elated as you are. But maybe when you make $40 million a year, it distorts your perspective on who you are, you know? It makes me long for the days of Jim Thorpe with a simple thanks game. But do we all need to call a penalty on ourselves? Because now they have this excessive celebration penalty. If you go nuts in the end zone, it's 15 yards. You do all these kind of crazy things. But do we need to throw a penalty flag on ourselves? Do we need to call a penalty on ourselves? Because we have inside of us just what those football players have, right? Great deal of pride. Do we need to be confronted, as Judd Nelson confronted in Mommy Ringwald, one of my favorite movies, The Breakfast Club, when he said to her, when they were all in Saturday detention, he said, you're just so full of yourself. I love that. You're just so full of yourself. Are we? Are we full of ourselves? Do we think that God is blessed to have us on his team? Do we think that we're more gifted than others? Do we think that God cannot accomplish his purposes without us? Do we celebrate excessively over our accomplishments and not give God the credit? Do we think we've earned everything we have because of us and not because God is just simply Jesus addressed some people who were full of themselves in Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. And hopefully we won't think about how different we are from them. Instead, maybe we think about how similar we are to them. Why do I want us to think like that? Because that's what Jesus is doing here in this gospel passage. You see, our sinful nature wants us to think that we would never go against God to benefit ourselves. Well, everyone else would for sure. Also, our sinful nature wants us to be concerned with our status. Additionally, our sinful nature wants us to think we're better than others. And our sinful nature wants us to think that we deserve to be recognized by others. 
but Jesus wants us to emulate him. He who humbled himself did not consider his heavenly glory something to be held on to, to be grasped. He let it go. Why? He humbled himself and became a man, lived a sinless life, and died on that cross for you and me to pay for our sins. That we might receive eternal life as a gift by faith in him alone. He wants us to pick up our cross daily and die to ourselves as well. Recently, we looked at the lectionary readings from Hebrews and said that as Old Testament saints knew they were citizens of another country and looked for a city whose builder and architect was God. We said by focusing on their heavenly home and God's kingdom, they're able to cross the faith finish line. And now they're watching us and encouraging us to do the same. We have the added advantage of looking to the pioneer and uh, finisher of our faith, Jesus. As we look to him, we need to remember we've not resisted sin to the point of shedding our blood like he did for us. Last week we were told in God's word in Hebrews 12 that our faith journeys would not necessarily be easy. We were admonished to endure hardship as discipline because God wants to conform us to the image of his son. He wants to make each and every one believer more like Christ. We were reminded that Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And if we are going to learn obedience by the things that we suffer, we're going to have to have a humble heart. We're going to have to see the bigger picture. That God is working in us. This doesn't come easy for us, does it? Back in our selfie culture, it's become much more difficult for us to not become legends in our own minds. Walter Cronkite recalls an incident on the Mystic River where he was in his boat going down it and some kids went by in a motorboat or something making a big racket and they waved at him and were yelling at him and his wife said, did you hear what they said? He goes, yes, they said, hello, Walter. She said, no, 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 they said, low water, low water. <laughs> in an article from Psychology Today, I found that in this age of the selfie, a new disorder has been codified by medical professionals. It's called body dysmorphic disorder. You may have heard of it. Or Snapchat disorder. Let's see, I had a discussion about Snapchat yesterday. Apparently, they're on Snapchat, which anyone can use. There are apps on Snapchat, which anyone can use to airbrush their appearance. To create their ideal self. But the Journal of the American Medical Association describes it this way, the pervasiveness of these filtered images can take a toll on one's self-esteem, make one feel inadequate for not looking a certain way in the real world, and may even act as a trigger for body dysmorphic disorder. That means you just don't like your body. You don't see it the way it accurately is. Some people become so enamored with their virtual selves that they uh, seek help, but not from a psychologist to accept themselves as they are, worse at all. They go to plastic surgeons to get their bodies changed to the ideal image that they want. These folks are constantly checking themselves as part of obsessive compulsive disorder, grooming excessively, over exercising, skin picking, hair plucking, comparing themselves to others. Antidepressants help, like Prozac and Zoloft, those things. But um, also, Psalm 139 can help, right? Memorize that if you struggle with that. Because in there, God says, what? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He made you exactly the way he wants you to be. And he wants you to accept that and thank him for it, words and all. <coughs> but there's another therapy as well that is helpful with this disorder. I've never heard of this. Called mirror exposure therapy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this treatment includes observing oneself in a mirror. Describing the body in neutral, objective terms, and exploring emotions that arise. The treatment attempts to help one see what negative things a person is telling themselves about their body as they look at themselves in the mirror. Huh. And then correcting that negative self-talk, the positive self-talk, the realistic self-talk. Now, how does that relate to this? Well, as believers, the second use of the law is what? It is a mirror for us to look into. The word of God. James tells us. 
The man who looks into the word of God and doesn't change his behavior is foolish, basically. So let's do that this morning. You see, our sinful nature wants to make us look good. We want to airbrush our spirituality. Don't we? we want to airbrush our souls for everybody to see just the good parts. One person suggested we suffer from soul dysmorphia. And God's word always brings us back to an accurate picture of ourselves. So because we all suffer from soul dysmorphia, let's look at ourselves by doing some mirror exposure therapy for our souls through the gospel passage. He addresses here in this passage the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He's having dinner at the home of a prominent Pharisee. And he's being carefully watched. Why are they watching it? They want to see what he does. Because it's the Sabbath, and if he heals on the Sabbath, he's a lawbreaker. He's going against Moses. But Jesus beats him to the punch. He's so smart. Puts him in a double bond, man. He just says, there's this man who has dropsy, where his body's swelling. And uh, the Pharisees were watching. And uh, Jesus says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they answer, if they answered yes, they would be lawbreakers. They answered no, their heartlessness, hard-heartedness would be shown to all. So what do they do? They don't say anything. He's got them. The real fun begins then in verse 5. Jesus asks the second question. If one of you has a child, if one of you has a child or an oxen, and oxen was the only way they survived, right? They couldn't flourish without oxen, without farm animals. That falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Why? Because they'll break the law if it's in their interest. But guess what? You and I might do that too. Let's not just throw spiritual stones at the Pharisees here. We all have a little bit of Pharisee in us, including the Pharisees. So there's cognitive dissonance between their beliefs and their actions. Because Jesus says you would immediately pull it out if it was your kid or the only way you survived. See, the Pharisees and, and experts in the law were always about promoting themselves. Thank God we're not like them, right? <laughs> However, remember the disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 46. What are they arguing about? Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? Yeah. Who's the most spiritual person here? And what does Jesus say? <laughs> Get me a little child. Get me a hat. Bring her to me. Right? Bring me a meeting. Bring it to me. Bring those two kiddos with Chris. Yeah. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Huh. You see, humble people don't really know that they're humble. They don't have a clue that they're humble. George Washington Carver, the scientist who developed hundreds of useful products for the peanut. When he was young, he said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. But God answered, that knowledge is reserved for me alone. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of the peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more near to your size. And he told me. Carter sounds like a humble man. Then Jesus told him a parable about a wedding feast. After observing how the Pharisees were seating themselves, he confronted them about how they were doing that. Some were taking seats of honor, apart from the host seating them there. Jesus told them that it would not be good when someone did this because somebody more distinguished than they might show up. And then I would move to a lesser spot. He says, start in the lower spot and let the host move you up. For those who exalt themselves will be humble and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Right. Pastor Darrell Bach, who went to seminary with, explains in his commentary what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying that honor is not to be seized. It is awarded. Jesus is not against giving honor to one who deserves it, but he is against the use of power and prestige for self aggrandizement Jesus honors the humble, and the highway of humility leads to the gate of heaven. Those who are truly humble persons recognize the desperate need for God, not any right to blessing. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Last Monday night, our cul-de-sac had a potluck 
Don and Cindy Richardson used their house. A nice gathering. Wonderful people. Even my neighbor, um, Dennis Robson. You know Dennis Curry? Uh, he went on a mission trip to Indonesia for two years. I was there for five days. Not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. Um, and Dan, uh, Dennis and I had a great conversation. It was just wonderful. These folks are so nice. My neighbor, Doug, who tried to set my lawn on fire on July 4th with fireworks. But I've forgiven Doug, no problem. We just don't let him have any matches anymore. But anyhow. <laughs> Um, he owns a hearing aid company. Eventually, I'll have to go to him at some point in time. But uh, anyhow, uh, just a wonderful event. But as I studied this passage, I'm thinking, uh, not, a, not nobody's fault. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying, where are the crippled? Where, where are the people who can't hear? I got great neighbors, man. I'm just telling you. Kurt's one of them. Melissa's another one. Unbelievable neighbors. Unbelievable. I just thought, oh man. If we're humble and not concerned about our status in the world, and we're impacted by the grace of God because of salvation being a free gift that we don't deserve, and God has just given it to us. Maybe we ought to think more about those folks that hurt them. And not avoid them, but welcome them into our lives. Freddie Manning contends that as the gospel of grace lays hold of us, we live in truth and reality. We don't care about our status. We live as new creatures in Christ. We become like the 92-year-old priest who was honored for his holiness by all the townspeople. He was a member of the Rotary Club, never missed a meeting, but one month he wasn't there. Nobody can understand it because he always sat in the corner in the same spot, never, ever missed Next month, he showed back up, and when he was asked what happened, he said, well, I spent 30 days in jail. People couldn't believe it, but the priest said it was a long story. He was heading into town and waiting for the train. Without a beautiful woman showed up on the arm of a policeman. She looked right at me and said, he did it, officer. I'm sure he's the one. Well, to tell you the truth, the priest said, I was so flattered, I pleaded guilty. <laughs> Brennan Manny puts it like this, my deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ and I've done nothing to earn it or deserve it. There's a story that years ago laid on a stormy night in Philadelphia. An elderly couple walked into a hotel. There was conventions in town that day, that night, and it was raining. And there were no rooms anywhere. And sure enough, the manager said, no, sir, I don't have a room for you. I'm sorry. And said, so what are we going to do? He said, wait a second. He said, hold it. Just take my room. And the man just said, oh, we, we can't do that. No, no, I'll be fine. You do that. And as he paid his bill the next morning, the old man said to the clerk, you know what? You're the kind of man who should be the boss of the best hotel in the United States. Maybe someday I'll build one for you. Clerk didn't think much about it. Two years passed. The clerk had almost forgotten the incident when he received a letter from the man. He recalled that stormy night and closed a round trip ticket to New York, asking the young man to pay them a visit. The old man met him in New York, led him to the corner of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. He then pointed to a great new building there, a place of reddish stone with turrets and watchtowers thrusting up to the sky. That, the older man, said is the hotel I have just built for you to manage. You must be joking, the young man said. I can assure you that I am not, said the older man. A sly smile playing around his mouth. The old man's name was William Waldorf Astor. And the magnificent structure was the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel. <coughs> Someone has said, when we give without worrying about being repaid, we can't foresee the rewards of our kindness. But Jesus guarantees we will be repaid in countless blessings at the resurrection of the righteous. And we simply say, like Jim Thorpe did at the 1912 Olympics to King Gustav, thanks King Jesus for everything. Remember, humble people 
leave their egos and their logos at the door. Because humble people, no, it's not about them. It's all about King Jesus and all God's people say. Amen. the mystery of faith, the Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to his holy name. And with the church on earth and the host in heaven, join in their unending hymn. Yeah. 
palace and reigns dear high. My blood is given for you a full supply, a covenant, a promise, a cleansing stream. Remember now, my children, what you
You said you'd come and share all my sorrows You said you'd come for all my tomorrows I came so close to sending you away Just like you promised, came here to stay I just had to pray and Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you. That for those tears I died Your goodness so great I can understand Dear Lord, I know That all this was planned I know you're here now And always will be you love this my chains, now I am free. But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. Felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Jesus, I give you my heart and my soul. I know that. Without God, I'd never be home. Savior, you opened all the right doors. And I thank you and praise you for my humble shores. Take me, I'm yours. And Jesus said, Come to the water, stand. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Hopefully you guys don't like this. Right, we'll like this one.